Laura, thank you so much for joining us for an Audible Sessions interview about your new book, Fix the System, Not the Women. Um, it's a brilliant listen. It's a heartbreaking listen. And I first wanted to ask, because you've written lots of books now, how is there still as much as ever to write about these topics, about feminism, about sexism, about misogyny? It's depressing, isn't it? <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me. I think for me this book was um, about a very different and new subject in a way, while of course it still relates to male violence and to all of those issues and to discrimination and sexism and so on. My books before had been about highlighting the experiences of individual women and trying to open people's eyes to the reality of sexism and gender inequality. This book for me was about really shifting the focus away from women, actually, and onto systems and institutional failings and inequalities, because I felt that, excitingly, we had a moment where people were talking about this a lot, and that felt like a moment of possibility. But what made me feel hugely frustrated and angry was that that response very quickly turned into a conversation about what women could do to fix the problem. And I really mean that on a grand scale. It happens again and again. After Sarah Everard's death, the police told women in Clapham not to go out alone at night. After Sabina Nessa was murdered, they handed out attack alarms to 200 local women. We had the Home Secretary talking about apps that women could download to keep themselves safe on nights, safe on nights out. We had the Met Police suggest that women could consider flagging down buses if they felt unsafe when an officer spoke to them. Um, after the murder of Bobby Ann McLeod, the city council leader said women shouldn't be putting themselves in compromising positions. Um, we had a police and crime commissioner saying Sarah Everard never should have submitted to the false arrest that was used to abduct her, that women needed to be more streetwise. And it felt like there was this cacophony of voices focusing on what silly women should have done differently and what other women could do better in the future. And so I really wanted for this book to move that focus away from women, away from victims and survivors and what they should or shouldn't have done, which we know is utter nonsense and has no correspondence to their experiences of abuse. And instead, onto the system failings that I increasingly think that victim blaming is used to distract us from. So this was a very different book for me because it was really about turning the camera almost 180 degrees in the other direction. Mm. And one of the big systems we're hearing a lot about is um, kind of legislation around abortion and the withdrawal of abortion rights, um, particularly in the US. So why is it that we're currently, system-wise, we seem to be going backwards? Yes, I think partly this uh, requires a recalibration of our concept of these systems, because I think that particularly if you are if you've grown up with with privilege, you have often been raised to think of the justice system, the criminal justice system, as a kind of infallible failsafe that will guarantee justice in our society. That it's there as almost a safety net, and I think what this recognizing the systemic failings re it requires us to realize that these systems were never necessarily set up in the first place to achieve justice for all of us uncomfortably. The reality is that these are systems that were put in place by powerful, rich, white men to protect themselves. And so it isn't a coincidence that we're now seeing abortion restrictions in the United States being enacted in ways that will have devastating impacts for women, for women of colour in particular, because the entire anti-abortion movement is rooted in outdated, white supremacist, racist um, assumptions about gender and, and really attempts to suppress and to control women via controlling their reproductive freedoms. And the same is true of what we're seeing in the criminal justice system in the UK, it seems like these are aberrations and shocking failings of justice, but when you flip it round, you realise in some ways these systems are working as they were always meant to. One of the clearest examples that, of that for me that came out when I was researching this book was a case where an abusive um, husband tracked down his ex-wife who had left him and he'd learned that she had started a new relationship. So he tracked her down to her gym 
waited in the car park outside, and when she came out, he physically assaulted her so badly, he threw her against a BMW, denting the car. So violent was the attack. She was taken to hospital with serious injuries, and in court, he was found guilty of both physical battery and criminal damage. But he was ordered to pay his ex-wife £150, and he was ordered to pay the owner of the BMW £818. And that's the value that our criminal justice system places on women versus property. It's not an isolated incident. We've seen under recent legislation the potential for people to be given longer jail sentences for assaulting statues than for assaulting women. So I think partly this is about reimagining how we think of these systems and recognising that, in fact, they can be fundamentally flawed and fundamentally unjust in the very fabric of their institutions and that we can be brave enough to imagine bold root and branch reform to institutions that we had previously always assumed were simply built the way they were and would be like that forever. Mm. But why is it that consistently, what is it about the the current social or societal situation where it seems for every step forward there's a step or two back? It's a good question. Um, I think that there is a lot of fear and I think that fear is being used to divide us. I think that there are very powerful forces at play who are able to manipulate the social kind of um, conversation, particularly online, in ways that make it appear that there is a huge groundswell of public support for certain things which there isn't necessarily. It's called astroturfing. It's kind of a tactic particularly used by the far right. So, for example, if you look at tweets, um, general tweets, then you would find that maybe 3 or 4% of them of a general sample would be from bot accounts. But if you look at tweets about Amber Heard and Johnny Depp, you'd find that that percentage was significantly higher. We know that far right conservative voices in the US have funded some some of that online campaign that we've seen really pushing those conversations. And I think what we're seeing there is an attempt to use that one case as a proxy for the whole Me Too movement, to use it to undermine feminism and feminist progress. I think that there are very powerful forces at play radicalising men and boys online into believing anti-feminist myths, believing that the gender pay gap is a myth, believing that false rape allegations are rife, believing that men everywhere are losing their jobs because of a witch hunt that's gone too far. And it has an impact. 27% of American men now say that they wouldn't have a one-to-one meeting with women in the workplace. I meet boys in school who say, why should we listen to you when women lie about rape all the time? The reality is that a man in the UK is 230 times more likely to be raped himself than falsely accused of rape. Mm. And so how young does... um misogyny start? What sort of sexual violence do we see in schools and and when is that beginning? It starts really from birth in the sense that we make baby grows for children aged 0 to 3 months and the boys ones say future superhero and the girls ones, and these are real examples, um, I hate my thighs. And the institutional aspect here is that within our school system, Almost a third, 30% of 16 to 18-year-old girls say that they experience unwanted sexual touching, in other words, sexual assault, at school in the UK. We know that a, a, almost exactly an average of one rape per day of the school term is being reported to police from UK schools. 80% of girls told the recent Ofsted inquiry that sexual assault was simply normal, common in their peer groups, that it happens all the time or some of the time. So this is a system suffused with male violence and we've been incredibly slow as a society to recognise this as an epidemic of school sexual violence and in so doing we have utterly failed girls. Mm. And in wanting to kind of talk about who is committing that violence, when it's boys, when it's children, how do you go about having a conversation and and changing that? Well, I think the key is to start the conversation much earlier. And whenever you suggest that, people react in horror. Oh, you can't talk to children about sex, about, you know, sexual violence at the age of two or three. But it's interesting because if we taught a two or a three-year-old going into nursery 
you don't hit another kid. Nobody would react in shock and say, you can't talk to them about violence. And so, of course, in a similarly age-appropriate way, there are ways to explain from the age of two, this is your body. You get to decide what happens to your body. That's someone else's body. They make choices about their body. We could be putting into place the building blocks of sexual consent and healthy boundaries and respect and healthy relationships from a much younger age. And the tragedy is that because we don't do that, we do end up in this situation where you have teenage boys committing sexual assault Assault without ever knowing that that's what they're doing. I was in a school recently where they'd had a rape case involving a 14-year-old boy and a teacher had said to him, why didn't you stop when she was crying? And he'd said, because it's normal for girls to cry during sex, because that's what he'd seen online and nobody had ever told him different. So I think it, it grows from a situation where there is a vacuum, where we're not giving young people the information they need and deserve about quite basic issues like sexual consent and healthy relationships. And the media, in kind of a broad sense, seems to encourage um, debate about sexism rather than there is this problem, we need to solve it how. Yes. So where is that line of debate where we're debating sexism? Where is that coming from? Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. Instead of news uh, broadcasters choosing to frame this as clearly this is an epidemic of violence, one woman's dying every three days, 85,000 women are raped every year and half a million sexually assaulted. What do we do about it? Where do we go from here? What are the solutions? Instead, they so often choose to frame it as, is there really still a problem? Hasn't feminism become a bit of a witch hunt? Aren't men the real victims here? In terms of where it comes from, well, we're looking at a media landscape where six editors of our national newspapers are women compared to 14 men, where women write a quarter of front page newspaper articles and 84% of the front pages we read are about a man, where over a fifth of young women working in the media are sexual harassed in their first few years on the job alone. And so it, it, itself, as an institution, the media, which, again, we have this idealised view of the media as something that holds truth, that speaks truth to power, that holds powerful people accountable, but it is itself an institution suffused with prejudice. And, of course, as with the case of all the institutions and systems we're talking about today, that isn't just prejudice in terms of an inequality in terms of sex. We've also seen recent really shocking stats about the number of people in newsrooms who come from uh, private school backgrounds, which is completely disproportionate to the kind of makeup of the general population. It is also very much the case if we're looking at race and ethnicity, disability and so on. And when the perspective that is being shared with us as this is the way that the world is, is actually being created through the lens of a very narrow group of people, I think there is an inevitable distortion. And to go back to kind of the, the police side of things, yeah. um, that is a whole kind of section in your book mm. and following the murder of Sarah Everard, which is obviously only one of the murders, but was the one that got the most press. Yeah. I think, you know, there's some acknowledgement in some parts that the police are misogynistic. So wh what is the, the root of that within the police? The problem is that when we see these as isolated incidents, we are encouraged to think of these as aberrations. And indeed, that's the terminology that's used. So the Met Police came out and said, we have the occasional badden. That was how they described Wayne Cousins, a bad apple. Nobody could have seen him coming. But people seem to forget that the other half of that phrase is that one bad apple spoils the whole barrel. And when you look into the barrel, you start to realise that statistically there is no way you can possibly deny that this is a cultural problem in policing. Wayne Cousins had been nicknamed the rapist by his colleagues. He'd been reported three times for indecent exposure and it hadn't been taken seriously enough to take him off duty. And the reality is that 2,000 Met police officers alone, one force in the country, were accused of sexual misconduct in the four-year period to 2020. And immediately then I think people go, oh, but They've probably got things in place to deal with that. But the reality is that over half of Met Police officers found guilty of sexual misconduct keep their jobs. There are elements of all sorts of different things in particular spheres that can make the problem worse, more corrosive, more difficult to, to tackle. And I'd say that that's also 
true in politics, that again, that is a situation that is susceptible to extremely high levels of abuse of power, of sexual harassment. And we've seen the evidence of that. Again, it's a workforce where just a third of our MPs are women versus two thirds being men. Uh, only six of our 23 cabinet ministers are women. So women are already on the back foot in terms of representation, having the power to change things. And within that system, 56 of our MPs are currently under investigation for sexual misconduct. And guess what phrase the cabinet used to describe it when that hit the headlines? They sent, they deployed the business secretary to do a circuit of the media and the term he used was bad apples. That phrase again. It's almost a tenth of our MPs. Mm, I was going to say, it's a big, that's a lot, that's a lot of bad apples. So to Jeez. have the brazen cheek to try and write that off, brush that off as a few bad apples, is absolutely shocking. And again, there's the added factor here that these are the people who are supposed to be tasked with making the laws to fix these problems. How can they possibly, when they're watching porn in Parliament, when they're supposedly giving out a Sexist of the Year award at their Christmas party, or when the man that this system has elevated to the most powerful man in our country is a man who has said that you should vote for his party to make your wife's breasts grow bigger, or that you should pat women on the bottom in the workplace and send them on their way, or that Muslim women look like letterboxes and bank robbers. The system, again, is utterly failing us, and we've got to recognise that it's an institutional problem. It's not just a coincidence, and it's not just one or two bad apples. Mm. Do we convict men for crimes against women? Well, if you come forward in this country to report a rape to the police, there is a 1.4% chance that the perpetrator will even receive a charge or summons, not even necessarily be convicted. So it really is not hysterical or exaggerating to say that we've essentially decriminalised rape. So we don't, no, we don't. Um, we have a system that offers no sense of justice to survivors, a system that makes survivors feel that they themselves are on the stand, that they themselves are being interrogated, that confiscates their mobile phones, that looks through previous communications and in some cases even past sexual history for ways to suggest that they were asking for it, that they wanted it. In courts, for example, in the last 10 years, the defence of sex games gone wrong. Yeah, I choked her to death, but she really wanted it, has risen by 90%. We've got men who murdered their wives in lockdown who have served about two years in jail because it was argued in court that they just snapped and lockdown was very stressful for them. And again, this feeds into the wider societal assumptions and norms that we make about power dynamics, about the value of women, about the inevitability of male violence. Mm. And in all this work you do, when some of the stories will be things you haven't experienced, but some of them will be things you have, how do you separate your life and your work? Well, in some ways you don't. Within perhaps two weeks of starting the Everyday Sexism Project in 2012, I was receiving 200 or on a very bad day, 300 messages a day from men, not just threatening to rape and murder me, but telling me which piece of furniture they'd like to use to give me internal injuries or sending a picture of the seven knives that they were planning to use to disembowel me with and which order they would use them in. And I think that that is something that isn't fully acknowledged because when we talk about online abuse, we are so desensitised to the concept now that it is common for people to quite dismissively shrug and say, just get offline, or, you know, if you don't like people agreeing with you, you're in the wrong job. And there is a lack of understanding, I think, of what it means for the lives of so many women in the public eye, and this goes for female politicians, for journalists as well, what it means to try to do your job and to come home from an interview to an email that says, I've just seen you on Sky News and I'd like to use your hair as handlebars and rape you until you die. And that has an effect. You know, there are now so many credible threats from men talking about ways to try and track me down and murder me that the police installed a panic alarm in my home. It, it, it affects your life. And I used to answer these questions by talking about, you know, the ways that I cope with it and the ways that you do put boundaries in place and that you try to have a really good support network and to create that separation. But I feel that there is this conversation now about self-care and... And while I applaud that, I also think 
it can be conflated in an unhelpful way. There is no scented candle or bubble bath in the world that gets rid of the reality of 200 people telling you that day how they want to murder you. And we need to acknowledge that because I think we're in danger of slipping into conversations about how women can navigate this instead of saying, this is shocking. This should be a source of national shame that women can't do their jobs in this country without experiencing this level of what is essentially psychological violence. And we all suffer. Democracy suffers. A third of the women who stood down at the most recent election cited abuse as one of their biggest driving factors for choosing to exit politics. I know so many teenage girls who wouldn't dream of going into politics because the discourse online is so toxic and so misogynistic. And again, this is an intersectional issue. We know that Diane Abbott receives over half of all the abuse that's levelled at female politicians. I have colleagues who are black women who experience dramatically worse online abuse that is mingled with racism as well as the misogyny that they face. We cannot accept this as the price of women being involved in our society at every level. We have to recognise it, and that's why I now... I'm answering that question in a different way because actually I think it's okay to say it's awful and it, it affects you and it bleeds into every area of your life and it has a huge impact on your family and your personal life and that isn't okay. Yeah, it's absolutely horrific. Um, yeah, I mean, usually I, I I try to end an interview on a vaguely <laughs> Sorry. hopeful note. No, do not apologise. Um, <laughs> and that was just so horrific um what i want to ask to close is we're looking for this systemic change um what's what's the next frontier that you feel like we're going to go for this and we're going we're gonna to get this change? That's a really good question. I think for me at the moment, there is a spotlight on policing, and I think that that is a very useful system perhaps to focus on. I think the fact that the Centre for Women's Justice is pushing for this inquiry is really powerful, and I think as many of us as possible should get behind it. I think that we also should be really looking at childcare as a broken system that's utterly failing women. For the first time in decades, the number of women not going to back to work after having a child is on the rise and statistics suggest that many women just are driven out by the fact that the cost of childcare, which is some of the highest in the world in the UK, yeah. is simply the sums don't add up. The cost of childcare is higher than what they can earn, even in a, a really well-paid job. That is a broken system that is, again, failing everybody. It's in nobody's interest to be losing talent from the workforce in that way. 54,000 women are losing their jobs every year because of maternity discrimination. It's shocking for every one. So that's another area, I think, of systemic focus and Pregnant Then Screwed are doing brilliant work there, the charity Maternity Action. There's a lot to support in terms of campaigns in that area as well. And there is so much hope because there are so many people who are battling on, in spite of everything that we've talked about and in spite yeah. of, you know, real personal cost, there are so many women and girls who are so bravely standing up and fighting on. Mm. And you know, the thing that perhaps give me, gives me the most hope of all is that when I go to schools now, I am meeting girls, and actually I have to say young people of all genders, boys as well, who are standing up and saying, this is unacceptable and yeah. we're feminists and this isn't okay. We know that hundreds of new feminist societies have been set up in just the last few years at schools across the UK. When I was at school, we wouldn't have known what the word feminism meant and I think that that is a huge source of hope and power for the future. Yeah. Well, Laura, thank you so much um, for everything you do, but for, also for this interview um, and your book, Fix the System, Not the Women, is brilliant. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me.